Benjamin Beanstalk uh, in a kind of a beautiful digital environment. Oh, where are you, Benjamin? So you can, you can start um, uh, your presentation. And wait a minute, I, I just have your title here. It says, Imagine the Museum's Future in the Past in our Digital Pandemonium. So please, Benjamin. Thank you, Rita, um, uh, for uh, organizing this and for inviting me. I, I start with a, <clears throat> I start with this obscure uh, uh, slide that I grabbed off the internet and you can't really July, but it's a little bit, let it symbolically represent some faded non-future that's there. <coughs> Sorry about that. The COVID pandemic is a drag. Rather than go to a restaurant, you get takeout. In place of traveling to Istanbul to meet people and eat real Turkish food, you do video meetings and eat Dutch Turkish takeout if you're lucky. Instead of a trip to Oxford to see the young Rembrandt exhibition for which I was ready to risk anything until it got so bad, they would have arrested me at the airport or border, a little like Rita's story. I watched a video of the show as Rita Koleva observes the digitalization of museums has now happened practically overnight for closing on future planning and possible institutions. Most of us hope some good things of the past will return, but I start with something creepier, our present digital pandemonium. John Milton's Paradise Lost described the palace of Satan in hell as pandemonium where the demon is over all, now understood as wild and noisy disorder or confusion. In the digital realm, that includes Zoom conferences, Zoom telephone calls, Zoom yoga, shopping, Netflix, never-ending horrible Trump news, YouTubes of Orson Welles or anything related or not related that YouTube chooses to show you. Past and future are potentially lost in a bottomless list of options. Yet there is always an alternative from no museums to imagine museums in new ways, in John Lennon's sense, no hell below us or around us. Also in Andre Malraux's sense of imaginary museum or museum without walls, by which he meant photographs, a positive premonition of the digital realm. I hope this was a sense Rita meant with her parentheses from no future to the future that needs to be seized. Uh, and I think her beautiful Finland station landscape showed that, to which I would add also the past needs to be seized. One possible strategy is to use digitization otherwise against the grain, au rebours, as a form of resistance to subvert institutions from remaining the same in a new digital guise. Before the pandemic or the pandemonium, museums were not simply the realm of the real or of art, but highly mediated and manipulated by all kinds of choices in politics. And the digital realm represents potentially a way to interrogate or overturn or imagine museums otherwise. That's a worthwhile goal, I think, especially when facilitated by the current circumstances or offering a way out of them and I assume that we're all here today partly to correct, connect around some possibility like that from completely diverse perspectives. And I should just briefly digress from my text to say, I ended up bearing down on something quite specific that I think is gonna be very different from all the rest of you. Maybe it's a historical opening on to the contemporary and the rest of this conference, but I really am very inspired by what Rita told us in her opening. And I want you to try to think of the, the, my strangely backward looking, although present talk, in terms of that back room and that back door. That's, that's where I would like to go. And I think also it's fun for my historical antechamber, maybe try to think of that as being akin to what you're all doing. So I live in Amsterdam and the Rijksmuseum, which closed again today officially, is undertaking nevertheless what they call an Operation Night Watch. A camera is photographing and digitizing the museum's most famous painting, Rembrandt's Night Watch, at a level that was not previously conceivable. 
This might seem like a gimmick, a performance art piece with a painting turned into a machine. Although <clears throat> some might prefer that to the crowds of tourists gawking at something primarily because it's so famous. <coughs> the man who invented the idea, <coughs> he's a brilliant American expat, Robert Erdman, is a real scientist. He's not hiding behind some borrowed technical plumage. Yet the initiative also rec reflects the advent of what is called technical art history, an outgrowth of con conservation that generates all kinds of new jobs and scientific data. But I'm not thoroughly convinced it's telling us much important or new about works of art as art. A case can even be made that Operation Nightwatch is one of those ways the institution anticipated a pandemic through a pandemonium that forecloses the future and past of the museum. Even when the Rakes Museum will be reopened, that level of detail that you see in these cameras will have little to do with seeing the painting in person, let alone in this crowd of gawkers. And one can imagine how some kind of Operation Mona Lisa will soon be necessary in order to get around the much denser crowds in that case. As a thought experiment then, I want to put forward a possible counter-operation night watch that would move digitally in the opposite direction from the inside to the outside of the painting. Now Rembrandt's night watch is located in the night watch room at the center of the Rijksmuseum, which in a very concrete sense was built around the painting as a national treasure in the 19th century. You see the little sculptures and columns and inscriptions all referring to Rembrandt. Some comparable militia group portraits are now included in the room for comparison, but not all of those that were originally located alongside Rembrandt's Night Watch in its original location, the Cloveniers Doolin, in what is now the Doolin Hotel. Uh, and uh, the, it's just actually outside. It's, our faces are maybe appropriately on top of where that was the actual room there. Um, and all of the group portraits were formerly housed in what was called the Amsterdam Historical Museum and is now called the Amsterdam Museum and is more contemporary and sociological in emphasis. Uh, in, in, indeed, uh, most re recently and well kind of famous case forswore the use of the term golden age. And the group portraits are moved to the Amsterdam Hermitage, a more conservative and commercial, although not necessarily less culturally significant, franchise of the renowned St. Petersburg Institution. Partly at stake is what is Dutch, then and now. Beautiful and profound works of great culture, brutal exploitation of other humans, self-righteous institutional face saving, corporate tourist gouging, or perhaps all of these at once by way of the Hermitage, if I'm lucky enough to worm my way into that, from Holland to Russia and back again with love. Another way outside the Rembrandt's Night Watch is through his other paintings. Some of his best paintings, his late Stahlmeisters, The Jewish Bride, Self-Portrait of St. Paul, are just outside the Night Watch room to the right or the east of the, at the end of the long honor gallery in the museum, uh, which has its most famous paintings. And there's other Rembrandt's paintings located elsewhere in the Rijksmuseum although not all of these are by Rembrandt in my view. A notable example are the full length portraits of Martin Solmans and Opian Kopit that made pretty significant news a few years ago when they were bought jointly by the Rijksmuseum and the Louvre from the Rothschilds. These were first displayed in the night watch room, yet you only need to compare them to see that they are not alike and not by the same artist. The Night Watch consists of figures with intense and distinct psychological characters rendered in astounding three-dimensional form in complex cubic space, situated in dramatic contrasts of dark and light with striking rich colors and subtle complex details. By contrast, the bodies and the heads of the companion portraits are relatively simple and flat released with rounded ovoid contours, including doughy faces with double chins. Their costly costumes of relative monotone, which compensate for a lack of volume through undulating surface folds, 
are displayed frontally and straightforwardly as if advertisements. One could also compare Rembrandt's portrait of Maria Tripp in the Rijksmuseum, which is akin to his night watch in all these respects, as are his paintings in the honor gallery and all of his etchings. All, every Rembrandt etching that you look at will have, have that level of detail and three dimensionality, psychological intensity and so on. Conversely, Martin and Opian, that's this couple, as they are now affectionately known, correspond in their qualities, formal and conceptual qualities, to several paintings by Rembrandt's most successful student, Covert Flink, which are likewise assigned to Rembrandt uh, and sometimes provided with his signature. According to Rembrandt's biographer, Arnold Haubracken, many paintings by Flink were sold as Rembrandt's in his time, although no examples have ever been identified. Haubracken also noted that if you wanted to get Rembrandt to paint your portrait, you had to, quote, beg him and still add money, quote. So perhaps if you did not pay enough, you received a studio work with his signature, which was presumably still preferable to one portraits by a less fashionable artist. In contrast to the fabulously wealthy Maria Tripp, Martin and Opian belonged to a younger generation of Amsterdam nouveau riche. They might have even preferred Flink's clarity and pedantic thoroughness to Rembrandt's mysterious complexity. Ironically, the same principles appear to be at work in the immense popularity of the portraits today, as recently explored in the full-length film devoted to them by Uke Hokendijk, also a substantial part of her most recent film last year, My Rembrandt. People are attracted by the famous name of the signature and the enormous sums and elitism associated with it and excited by the discovery of yet another pair of Rembrandt portraits in, in private hands, remarkably, yet all too conveniently. Conversely and necessarily, no one is discussing formal or conceptual qualities of the compositions, comparing them to Rembrandt's well-known paintings, addressing his students, or underlying methodological problems in scholarship. This would be the analogy of the back room in my case. A last way outside Rembrandt's night watch leads to its central place in the history of art, and by extension, the history of art history. Before Rembrandt, artists served at the behest of institutions, the church or monarchs, Whereas by the time of his night watch in 1642 in Rubens' wake, Rembrandt had come to take center stage as the most famous artist in Europe. Early militia portraits depicted the members dressed in fine costumes, holding symbolic weapons or other objects, standing or seated beside one another, looking out at the viewer, whereas Rembrandt staged a narrative closer to an Italian history painting. He thereby achieved a near annihilation of the group portrait altogether, as Alois Regal put it in his unsurpassed 1898 study, Das Holländische Gruppenportrait. Rembrandt's student, Samuel van Hoogstraten, already wrote that the Night Watch deserves criticism because Rembrandt made more work of the large picture of his choice than the sitter's portrait. Even worse, by portraying what was essentially an elite social club with little military significance in a fictional scenario, Rembrandt made his sitters look ridiculous, it seems maliciously so. The dwarf-like maiden in a sunbeam with the features of Saskia's wife, of Rembrandt's wife Saskia, who died in the course of his composition, makes sense as a posthumous tribute in his most ambitious work and can be justified with as an eccentric composition as a sutler or sexual companion and cook who accompanied traveling militias. The dead poultry hanging from her belt makes sense in the in this culinary and by extension, erotic context, and commentators have noted a reference to the emblem of the cloveneer militia in the chicken's claw, although that is hardly an eagle's talon and a plausible aspiration of the group's martial virtues. The captain's extended hand at the center, giving the order to march out, casts a shadow across his lieutenant's nether regions and appears to grasp for something. Scholars have proposed that he hold, the hand holds the lion of Amsterdam embroidered on the lieutenant's coat. Yet as Operation Night Watch has made all too clear, the fingers do not actually encompass the lion, which is also not visible from even a few feet before the painting, whereas the uncanny shadow hand is unmistakable from across the room. Now, whether the Amsterdam elite abandoned Rembrandt after his night watch, as early scholars assumed, 
or he abandoned them in the wake of his wife's death and seeming financial success, which proved temporary, he painted fewer portraits and less work generally in the following years. He was also excluded from the commissions for the new town hall of Amsterdam, and when his oath of the Batavians was belatedly included, it was soon after rejected and cut down as a fragment. Only in the 19th century, with the founding of the National Imperial Rijksmuseum with a night watch room at its center, festooned with columns and symbolic inscriptions evoking Rembrandt's and Saskia's grave, did he return to center stage. If the Rijksmuseum ever opens again and that machine is removed from Rembrandt's night watch, or until then, digital possibilities can help to imagine a Rijksmuseum and other museums in Amsterdam and elsewhere without institutional walls to overcome the investments and errors of the authorities and to imagine Rembrandt's art anew. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Benjamin.